Jennifer. Welcome back to My Flagstaff Home. I am here today to teach you how to make your own soap. And this recipe of soap uses goat's milk. So anyway, this is a lot of fun and I'm excited to share this with you. So I learned how to do this several years ago, but I had wanted to make my own soap for a long time, but I was really nervous about using lye and working with lye because lye is a caustic substance that can burn your skin. So in this recipe, we're not talking about melt and pour soap. We're not talking about going over to um, Hobby Lobby and buying some soap that's already been made and then melting it down and adding colors and fragrances and then pouring it into a mold and letting that harden up. No, we're talking about from scratch using different kinds of oils and then you add your solution that in, that has um, lye in it and it for, it creates a hard a hardened soap out of oils and so that's what we're going to learn how to do well i was really nervous about doing that and finally i had a girlfriend show me how to do it and it's really not that difficult you just have to take precautions you just need to be careful because like I said, lye is a caustic substance and it can burn. Um, it is often used as um, something that breaks up really difficult drain clogs. Uh, I've seen packages that I've purchased that say that that's what it's for. And um, so anyway, but all of this to say, don't worry about putting it in your soap because after you make soap with it, you let it cure and anything that could possibly burn your skin, um, you know, goes away by the time you actually use the soap. So, so most soaps that you encounter, hard soaps, liquid soaps, most of them involve the use of lye. So don't be worried. Okay, so, um, so anyway, let's talk about the precautions that you need to take first, and then we'll get into making the recipe. And I just wanna let you know, um, if you're gonna come back and watch this again, which I'm assuming you will if you're gonna make the soap, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put timestamps in. So I'm gonna just, you know, have them on the screen here so you can see, um, you know, like the supply, the precautions you need to take, the supplies you're gonna need, and then getting down to making the soap. So when you come back in the future, you can just go back to where the timestamp is and, um, and watch from there. Okay, so let's talk about those precautions. So you don't wanna burn your skin. You certainly don't wanna get any of it splashed into your eyes and you don't want to hurt anybody in your household. So, so let's start by saying that when you're going to make soap, you need to make sure that any children in your house are not in your house or at least not in the area where you're going to be. Um, if you have small children, just, just have them be with grandma for the day or or you know whatever, but just just not not anywhere where they could run around or and trip over something, and because that would just be horrible to have a caustic substance you know splash on them. Um, the same with pets. You want to make sure. I always have my my dog and my two cats. I always put them outside or put them in another room and close the door. Um, so so absolutely make sure that they are out of the room. And the other thing is when you're using the lye, you want to have um, some place where it's not like a closed in area because that for a short period of time, there will be some, some fumes. And so you either want to have a window in your kitchen or you want to mix it up on your patio or in your garage or, you know, something like that. So in this, so in this house, I'm fortunate enough to have a big window in my kitchen. In my last house, I, I used to go out and do this in my garage. But then when you do it, when you mix your lye in the garage, that means you got to walk with the lye and so you have to make sure you're not going to spill it anywhere. So anyway, those are the kind of precautions you need to, you know, just kind of take. And then you need some protective gear. So the first thing that you're going to need is some, um, some eye covering. So if you wear glasses, then that will cover your eyes. But if you splash, if you were to splash it, it's going to protect your eyes, but ruin your glasses. So you could just use goggles that will either, you could just use if you don't wear glasses or put them over your glasses. So those clear goggles. So you want that just in case I have never had a batch of soap splash, but you know, anything can happen. So you want to make sure that you protect your eyes. The other thing you really want to do is protect your hands and your arms. 
Um, so, so what I do is I put on these gloves. These are not just like the kinds of gloves you use to wash dishes with. Those are not heavy duty enough. These, I will link them in the space below. In fact, I'll link all the supplies in the space below this video. These are specifically intended for using with chemicals. And they've got like a, um, well, they're sort of slippery on this green part and a little more textured on this. But uh, yeah, I, I always make sure that I am wearing some, some really nice gloves. These are not expensive. I, when I bought them on Amazon, they were under $10. So I don't know what they are at the time that you're watching this video, but they, they're probably not going to be terribly expensive, but really necessary. So, and then the other thing I do, like I'm, I actually made this soap at another time, so I'm not going to be making it right now. Um, I, I just wear a lo longer sleeve so that when, see how my skin right here. So I would wear a longer sleeve shirt with that, just in case I've never, I've never splashed it, but you know, just in case. Now here's one more precaution. In case you do happen to splash some of the lye, um, you can't just wash your hand under water. You can't just put your skin under water. What you need is to use vinegar, white vinegar, and make sure that you have a good amount of it. So not just like a fourth of a cup left in a bottle. You want a whole bottle or a jug or something, and you want to have it somewhere convenient. I've never, in all the batches of soap that I have made, I've never once had to use it, but it's always a good idea to have it on hand. So in case an accident happens, you can pour the vinegar on there and then you can, you know, and you can keep doing that to get it off of your skin. Okay. So have I scared you off? I hope I haven't scared you off, but I hope that I have filled you with a healthy respect for what lye can do if you're not careful. All right, so what do you need for making your soap? Let's talk about the physical supplies first. So you need to have a stainless steel pot. This one is actually way too big. Um, I thought that I would be able to make double batches of soap, but when I tried that one time, um, gosh, I had to blend it for so long that it almost burned out my stick blender and so now i only make single batches and so i really could get away with having a much smaller pot than this but it has to be stainless steel you also it because otherwise it will create a chemical reaction that will not make the soap form just so you know and then um you also need a spoon that is stainless steel this is the one i use but it is also very large and i could actually use a smaller one and um, then um, what I also use is, um, I have two glass measuring cups. Really, they don't have to be measuring cups. They just need to be containers. So this one is the one that I put my live granules in when I'm measuring it out. And then this is what I mix my lye in. So I mix my water, my goat's milk, and my lye in this. And so that's what I... That's what I put those in. You're also going to need a thermometer. So I use two of them. I have one that I use in my oil mixture and I have another one that I use in my lye mixture. So I have like a meat thermometer that I use and I have a candy thermometer. Um, no particular reason. I actually don't use a meat thermometer very, very often. And so these just happen to be ones that I have sort of just taken from my kitchen and I use them for soap making now. So, um, so yeah, you could just use one thermometer, except that you're going to have to wash it when you go from testing the temperature of your oils to testing the temperature of your, of your life. So it helps to have two. Um, you do need a stick blender. Another thing you're going to need is a scale so that you can do some fairly exact measurements. I have found that it's okay with this recipe to do a little bit of rounding up, rounding down. Like for example, if it says that you need 12.35 um, ounces of oil, it's okay to do 12.4. And then you're also going to need 
um, some colors if you want to add color. Now, goat's milk is going to make your soap, if you put no color in it, it's going to make your soap um, kind of a yellowy color, kind of a creamy, not a bright yellow, just sort of a subtle, creamy, yellowy color. And so any coloring that you mix with it is going to mix with that yellow color. So, so you're not ever going to be able to get blue. So let's say um, you mix, uh, you put blue in there. Well, blue and yellow makes what? It makes green. And so that's what you're going to end up getting. So I will do another video where we just talk about a shea butter soap recipe that doesn't use goat's milk. And in that, for that, you can make purple and blue and pink and all different colors of soap. But I stay with sort of earth tone colors. You can see here with these soaps that I've got stripes. But um, this is the natural color. The bottom is the natural color. The next step up is kind of a greenish color where I had added blue. The next one I had added kind of a, an orangey color and it made it sort of terracotta. And then this top one um, is I added a little bit of pearly white color to it and it just made it a little bit darker yellow than the, than the bottom. So what I use is a, it's a mica powder and you can get a box like this one, I'll link it for you, that has a whole bunch of different colors in it. So if you're just getting started and you're trying to figure out what colors are your favorite, you can get this assortment. This one had 15 different colors. But then if you kind of, you know, gravitate back to the same colors all the time, which I do, then you can buy larger containers of just one color at a time. And so, yeah, so I have I have several of these kind of things. So like the purple and the blue, these are things I'm going to use with my shea butter. And then I have some others, you know, of course, that I'm going to do use with my goat's milk. Um, okay, also, other supplies you're going to need. You're going to need soap molds. You could use the kind of molds that are shaped like something, like a rose, or maybe it's a bar of soap and it has some kind of design in it. You could do that. I make these bricks. <laughs> so I have two that are fairly large. They've got silicone inside them. And then the box part of it just kind of holds it steady because if you were to pour the mixture in, it's going to get all floppy. And so, so you need something that holds it. So I have two of these and these particular molds that I have have lids. They don't snap on or hook on. They just sort of set on top. It is, but when we get to the end, I'll talk about why it's helpful to have lids, but I do have one mold that does not have lids or a lid. And this one is a smaller mold. And, um, it, it, like, look at this, see how it's not quite as wide and it's also not quite as long. So, but what's cool about this one is it has an insert Oh yeah, I'm gonna pop in a picture here of this. So you put this in and it makes the most beautiful uh, design in the top of the soap. So I'll take a look at the, the picture that shows the design. And so, yeah, there's, there's different kinds of things that you can do like that too. So this one I love, it gives my soap uh, little impressions of butterflies and flowers. And so let me slide this in here. So, yeah, so it just goes in the bottom like that. So actually what is the bottom of here is going to end up being the top of the soap because that's where, that's where the, the design is. So you're going to need some molds and then you're also going to need a cutter. So you could just use a knife. You don't have to have anything special for it. I like to use this wavy cutter because it gives a texture to the sides of the soap when you, when you cut them. And so it gives a, a neat little, you know, pattern on it. So, but you can just use a knife. You don't have to use a wavy cutter. You're also going to need some essential oils that, and I'm going to get to the main ingredients here, but you're going to need some essential oils and really, you know, you can use high quality essential oils, but you can also use some ones that are a little less expensive. Um, I have often purchased them at Sprouts, uh, bottles that are not terribly expensive. And um, 
it's sometimes you think, well, I just don't even know like what scent to put in. Um, like look up different kinds of homemade soaps that people make or like, um, what's the name of that company? Indigo Wild. They make Zum bars. And if you look at some of the names of their soaps, that'll give you some ideas for combinations. One combination that I love to make is a lavender and cedarwood soap or um, scented soap. Um, so I use those as my essential oils. And another one that I use a lot, and that's what these are, is lemon, lavender, and patchouli. I'm not a big fan of patchouli scent, but when you mix patchouli with lavender and lemon, it smells so good. It gives it a really nice undertone that doesn't make it seem too girly. And um, yeah, so so anyway, choose whatever whatever essential oils you want, but you, you'll want to choose something or you don't have to. It can be an unscented soap as well. So the other thing that is an optional item, and then we'll get to the actual oils you're going to need and the lye and all of that. Um, what you're going to need is um, an optional item is vitamin E oil. And it's a very small amount. It's optional. I've seen it listed as an antifungal. I don't know if soap somehow gets fungus. I've never seen it happen in all the years that I've been making it. But I like to put it in because vitamin E oil is nice for the skin. So I just add it. It's a small amount that I add in. Um, and then uh, you're also going to need some honey, a small amount of honey. So let, now let's talk about the oils. Yes. And you're going to need olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil. And then, of course, you're going to need lye. And to find lye, you can either buy it online or you can go into a hardware store, believe it or not. I went into Ace Hardware and I had no idea where, I, where to even look to find it. Um, and they directed me over to the plumbing section. <laughs> That's where I found it. So, so you're going to need a container of lye. You could also look in a craft store. If they have a soap section, they might sell lye there. So, like I said, be really careful with it. When you open it up, don't go sticking your nose in it. It's fumey kind of thing. Yeah, don't do that. So, okay. And then um, the last thing you're going to need is goat's milk. So, let me tell you about goat's milk. I used to have access to fresh goat's milk. I had a friend who raised goats. And I now no longer live near her. And so, I don't have access to fresh goat's milk anymore. Fresh goat's milk is always going to be your best option, but you don't need it. You do not need it. So you can just go to Sprouts or Whole Foods and buy a half gallon of goat's milk. It's going, it's expensive. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But it, a batch of soap does not require a lot of it. So I think the last time I divvied out my, my portions of goat's milk, I determined that a half gallon was going to make 18 batches of goat's milk soap. So yeah, so so a little, a little goes a long way. A lot goes a long way. All right, so I'm going to show you though what you have to do in preparation before you make your goat's milk soap, and that is that you have to freeze the goat's milk. So the reason you have to freeze it is that when the goat's milk and the lye get together, it may, they get hot and the lye will actually curdle the goat's milk. If you were to just use refrigerated goat's milk and then add lye to it, it's that milk is going to curdle. And so even if you use any other kind of milk, um, cow's milk, they decided to make soap with cow's milk. I don't know if people do that, but if they did, um, and, um, so yeah, and I don't know about milks that aren't actually like from animals. I don't know if, if what, I don't know about using almond milk or soy milk or any of that, but I do know for sure that with animal milk, you need to make sure you freeze it before you use it. So here's the best thing to do. If you can find a mold that has the, that is the exact size of the amount you need. And in this recipe, uh, let's see. 
In this recipe, you need um, 3.35 is what it says. You can do 3.4 ounces of goat's milk in the batch. And this mold here, each one of these, when I pour milk into it, it's, a, it's almost exactly the amount that I need. So what I do ahead of time is I take this, I set it on a cookie sheet. These are floppy. So you gotta use a cookie sheet. Set them on a cookie sheet, pour milk into each section, and then put it in the freezer. And then after it has frozen, solid, you pop them out, put them in a freezer bag, and then fill it again on the cookie sheet, put them in the freezer, and then the same thing until you're finished. And then you'll have all of your goat's milk in like a zip top bag that is frozen. And each time you make a batch of soap, you just need one block of this to put in with your soap. Okay, so those are your supplies. Now we're gonna get on to making the recipe. The last time I made it, I snapped pictures along the way and I also filmed some video along the way, kind of working with one hand and filming with my phone. And so I'm gonna walk you through part of it. I'm gonna narrate from here and part of it, I'm gonna be popping in these different clips. So we're gonna start by mixing our oils together. So you're gonna take this and you're gonna set it on the stove and you're gonna put your oil, your olive oil, your avocado oil, and your coconut oil. And really you're gonna heat it up just enough so that the coconut oil starts to melt. And then when it starts to melt, just turn it off. Now, if you have a gas stove, um, well, at least at my last house with a gas stove, I could just turn it off and leave this on the burner and it would be fine. On this, at this house, I have a glass top. And so if I just turn it off and leave this on there, it keeps getting hotter and hotter. And so, so I recommend with this kind of a stove to turn off the burner and move it off. So the idea is that you want your soap, your oil mixture, and then later your goat's milk mixture to be between 90 and 110 degrees. It doesn't matter if they're both the same. One of them could be 95 degrees and the other could be 102. It doesn't matter if they just both have to be in that range. So you don't wanna get your oils too hot so that you spend all your time trying to cool it down and then all of a sudden your goat's milk mixture with the lye is, you know, is cooling down that when you mix your lye and your goat's milk and your water together, the temperature, at least every time I've ever done it, is somewhere around 140 degrees. And so I'm waiting for it to come down. So I don't want to get this up around 180 and then I'm kind of panicking about, you know, what, what to do. I don't actually know. Let me just tell you that if I were making my soap and my, if your oil mixture were to get too cool you could always turn the burner on again and you could warm it up but if your lye mixture goes below 90 i don't even know what you do i i think i would just get rid of it i don't even know it just doesn't seem safe to like microwave it or or whatever so just try not to make that happen try to make sure that you've got everything timed out properly so you're going to start by warming up those um those oils and then make sure that while you're doing this, get your other ingredients ready. You want to make sure that your, your mica powders, your colors are, you've picked them out and they're just sitting there ready to use. You want to measure out your one and a half teaspoons of essential oil. So like when I'm doing uh, lemon, lavender, and patchouli, I'm going to do a half a teaspoon of each one. Half a teaspoon of lemon, half a teaspoon of lavender half a teaspoon of patchouli. So I'm gonna go ahead and measure that out and put it in a little dish. I'm gonna measure out my one tablespoon of honey and put that in a dish. I wanna have all of it ready. And the other thing I'm gonna do is clear off my sink area. I wanna make sure that I don't have, like right now I've got some stuff drying in my sink. No, we want that cleared out. We want anything close by, if you have a dish of fruit or anything, all of this you need to get away so that if there was a splash of some kind, you know that you don't have it um, splashing on other stuff. So get everything cleared off of your counter over there. Um, so you can take care of all this stuff while you're heating 
your oils. And as soon, like I said, as soon as the coconut oil starts to melt, when you see it start to melt, turn off the burner. If you've got a glass top, move it off that heat. And then test the temperature. And if it needs to go back on, you can you can do that. But um, but just don't let it get too hot. <clears throat> so the next step is that you're going to measure out your lye and mix with the water and goat's milk. So, so we're going to start mixing our goat's milk, water, and lye. And so this is where I take my glass um, measuring cup and I go ahead and turn it on so that it's sitting on here and then it when it turns on, it goes to zero. And then I'm gonna measure out my water in there and I'm gonna put in my block of frozen goat's milk. So I've got my water and my frozen goat's milk, not putting in the lot. So at this point, I wanna put on my gloves and then I'm going to make sure that I, I go outside or I go in my garage or I'm by my window, whatever, uh, because there will be some fumes, not horrible, but some, so it is a little fumey. Make sure your pets are out of the way. Make sure your children are not anywhere close by. And so I'm just slowly adding in um, more of the lye. Just slowly adding some in and then stirring it very gently. I don't want to cause any splashing. Just keep doing that by the time I add add all the lye in that um, block of frozen goat's milk will, will be completely melted. And then I'm not exactly sure why, but it, it seems like toward the end of adding the lye into the goat's milk and water, yeah, just it seems like no matter how slowly I add the lye to the mixture, it always turns yellow right at the end. So right now I have a candy thermometer in here. Sorry about that glaring light. I have a candy thermometer in here that's reading a hundred and like, oh, about 125. Uh, and it needs to be between 90 and 110 for me to be able to use it. And then over here, this is the lye mixture. And this thermometer is reading just under 120. So you can get these to cool down faster by just um, taking a, this is a stainless steel spoon. You could kind of take the stainless steel spoon and you can kind of stir it gently or even pick up some of the solution and let it pour back in. That kind of gets some of the air temperature um, into the, the liquid to cool it down. Um, don't, don't try to rush it too much because if it goes below 90, then you're, then you've ruined it. So, um, so just kind of take your time, you know, you can get other things ready. So now that we have these, um, and let's say you've got your temperatures now where they need to be in the right range. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pour them into our pot. I put this in the sink. I put my gloves on at this point and I get my stick blender out. Um, you're going to make sure that you have your eye protection on, glasses, goggles, whatever it is. You want to have all of this before you start doing this. And so then you're going to take, now obviously I don't have this plugged in, but I'm going to pop in a clip here so that you can see it. Okay, so we're at about 110 on the oil, just under 110 on the lye mixture. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my big pot that has the oil in it. I'm going to move it over into this part of the sink. Okay, so I have my stick blender here. I have my essential oils in that little dish there. And I have a tablespoon of honey in that one. I ran out of uh, vitamin E oil. And that is okay, actually. Always it's optional in every recipe I've ever seen. So what I'm going to do next, and I'm not going to be able to film this while I do it, but I'm going to pour... The, I'm going to make sure that I get my gloves on, my eye protection on, and then I'm going to pour the lye mixture in here, turn this on, and I am just going to slowly just mix and mix and mix until this comes to trace. And what The idea is that you want to bring the mixture to what is called trace. Uh, you'll notice that it goes from being kind of a clear... You know, clear sort of solution, you know how oil would be, 
um, and then it's going to start getting kind of milky colored and then um, and then more opaque as you keep going. So we want to bring this to what they call trace. Let me try to give you an example of what trace is. So it, let's imagine that you have a bowl of soup in front of you and you take a spoon of the soup and then you pour it back into the soup. What you have scooped up on your spoon and poured back in goes straight back into the mixture, right? You don't even see it. It's not like you see a trail of the broth. It just goes back into the soup. Okay, that's not what you want. That is not trace. On the other hand, let's think about um, pancake batter. So your mixture is probably not going to be as thick as some pancake batters can be, but let's just use that as an example. You take a pancake batter, you scoop it up, and when you drizzle it across, you'll see a trail of the batter that kind of sets on top for just a few seconds before it goes back into the mixture. That's what trace is. You don't want it to be so thick that when you drizzle it across it, the, you can see the trail and it stays there. Um, you want it so that you can see it and then it goes back into the mixture a couple seconds later. It has to get to that point in order for it to later solidify and turn into soap. Can you over trace the mixture? Yes, I understand that it is possible to do that. Um, I don't exactly know what happens if you over trace it. I don't know if it ruins the soap. Um, I don't think I've ever over traced. I may have, but I've never had a batch of soap go bad. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know. All I know is that you're supposed to try to get it just so that you can see the trail of the mixture across the top when you drizzle it. And then a few seconds later, it would go and dissipate into the mixture. <laughs> see a little line except for the light that's overhead that's kind of blocking up you can see a little line and then it kind of goes back in sinks back down but that's now at trace that's what you want to try to do so how long does it take it, it really is going to depend on it could depend on the soap recipe you're using it could depend on the humidity in the air it could be depend on whether your house is warmer or cooler. I don't know. There could be a lot of factors. So I cannot tell you a certain amount of time. For me, it's in the five minute range around that. But don't just turn on a timer and, you know, not pay attention. You want to make sure that you're periodically lifting up your stick blender, kind of drag it across, you know, like you pick it up and it's dripping. It's kind of it's just kind of drag it across so it drips across the top. And if you can't see what dripped, it's not at trace. You keep going. As soon as you think you can see something going across there, then, um, you know, then you're at trace. So at that point, you're going to add your essential oils, your honey, and your vitamin E oil. And then you're going to take your stick blender again and just mix it just enough so that it's, it's blended in. And now you're ready to put in your color. Now, well, there you can do it at a different time. But if you're going to make all of it all one color, then you can go ahead and take whatever color or colors you want to mix in there. Take your blender again and just kind of blend it in so that it's all mixed. Some people will take their color and shake it in and then take like a straw or some kind of a, like a popsicle stick and kind of you know, run it through so that it makes it swirly. I mean, you can kind of play with, with what you're going to do with the colors, but that would be, that would be a time to do it. You can also do colors once they're put, the mixture is put in the molds. So, but for this, what I'm showing you today, when I made these, um, I, I just mixed the color all at once. Now, this is different colors, right? So I made four batches of soap to get this. And uh, if you're going to make three things full like this, it's going to take four batches. Um, if you just do one batch of the recipe I have, you're going to end up with just a very small, you know, a much smaller amount. 
So, so I started by doing one without any color, and then I went and added to make, to make another batch that was a different color. What you end up doing is that you just pour the batch in and use your um, stainless steel spoon to kind of scoop it out and scrape off the sides and, and fill it in. And then at that point, you want to smack it on the counter. And so part of that is to get that to be um, sort of smoothed out and even on top. It doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. And then the other thing is to get air bu bubbles out. So you're just going to just kind of like this. So, you know, we're not, you know, smacking it really hard, but we're just kind of banging it a little bit to get any of the bubbles out. So then at this point, you've got one batch done and now you're going to clean everything up so that you can start with a second batch. If you're going to, if you're using small molds, you can just do the one, but if you're making like what I'm doing here and end up making four batches, you have to clean everything up again. So you are going to need to wash out your pot because you've got to put oils in here again and you don't want them touching live to begin with. So you actually need to use some soap and water and wash out your pot. You need to wash off your spoon. So get everything washed and then you just start again from the beginning. And after you finish that batch and you add whatever color you want, then you pour in your second batch on here and just pour it slowly. During the time that you have been cleaning up and then getting started with your next batch, what was in here will start to solidify. It's not going to get completely hard. So if you pour in the second batch, like just dump it in, it's actually going to mix the colors together. Um, so you just want to go very gently, very slowly, if you want it to hold that striped look. And so then you put that on there, same thing. You know, I kind of sometimes do this business with it to get it to go all the way across evenly. And then you want to do some smacking to get the bubbles to come out. And you keep doing that until they're full. All right, so now that I have these three full, and this did take four batches. I was thinking it was five, but it, it took four to fill it. These two large ones come, came with lids, and so I'm going to just, they don't like secure on, they're loose, but you cover them up because the idea is that you want your soap to stay warm for the first 24 hours for sure, and you want to keep them as warm as possible so that they end up getting being a nice even color in the middle. Sometimes the center can get dark if it doesn't have the right um, temperature or consistent temperature during the first 48 hours. So, so anyway, I am going to take these and cover them, wrap them up in a towel. I just realized if I do this, this towel is going to land right on this one that doesn't have a lid. So I'm going to do it a different way. But I'm going to wrap it up in a towel and then I'm going to stick it in a nice warm closet and leave it there for two days. Like in a climate like Arizona, 48 hours is going to be enough time. If you live someplace like Florida, then you're going to need 72 hours. When you get to that point, you're going to then pop your soap out of the mold and you'll end up with this with a brick of soap and you just start peeling it off. If it hasn't set well enough, then you're going to see the edges and the corners when you start to pull this, peel this off, you're going to see them kind of mush and you don't want that to happen. So here are the three bricks of soap and they look like they're still, I mean, they're, they are still damp in the center, especially, but now I usually have, I've never made soap since we've moved here to Florida and I'm from Arizona. So two days, 48 hours was always enough time in Arizona that I could pop it out of the mold and then cut it into slices and then let those cure. So I'm just going to take it kind of carefully with the first one. And if it seems like it's too soft, then I'll wait another day. I just want to show you. So I took it out of the wood and then I loosen up and I've got, of course, I'm holding the camera in one hand. So I loosen it up on the edges and then you kind of really do have to sort of gently peel it off and I'm not going to do this right now because I need two hands to do it 
but you do kind of peel it off and it's, if it starts to mush too much on the corners, then I'll know it's not really ready yet. But I mean, if, they, if it does like mush in a little, it's okay. So let's try it and see. Okay, it peeled off okay. It's a little softer than what I would say when I have done this in a drier climate. So, um, but it does look pretty good. It's holding together nicely. It didn't really misshape or anything like that while I was removing it. And so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it up. I wanna show you this one. This is the one that was in the green mold and it has that flower print in it. And so you kind of have to peel that off. And so when that peels off, it leaves a really cool design. It's not pretty. Okay, these cut all perfectly. So um, I ended up with a total of 27 bars of soap from those three molds. And one, two, three, four, five, six of them came from that, that flower mold. And, that and then you're gonna stand your soap up so that it can kind of have airflow around it and make sure you've got some space between each individual bar. I would not recommend laying them on that longer flat side. I would say the ends are better to stand them on. And then the next day, go and flip them over the other way so that part that was on the bottom gets some airflow. So for the first few days, I, I flip them a lot. And then about, then I just leave them for a couple of, I don't cover them. They're just on a plate. I usually keep them. Honestly, I have a file cabinet in a closet and I set, set the plates on top of that. And that's where I put them because they're not going to get disturbed. And so then maybe in a couple of weeks, I'll flip them again. And then I just leave them and they need to cure for anywhere from four to six weeks. If you live in a dry climate, I would say four would be okay. If you live in a humid climate, for sure, let your minimum amount of time curing be six weeks. Um, it is always better to cure for longer. First of all, you cure because you want to make sure that the lye is no longer active. And so, so you want to make sure that you've let it sit long enough that the lye is not going to irritate your skin when you use it. And the other reason why you want to let it cure for a while is you want to have some of the moisture dissipate from it. Because let's just imagine if you had a lotion bar and you stuck it under a faucet, um, it's the water is just going to make it disintegrate, right? So the harder the bar of soap is, the longer it's going to last. So if you, the, when you use your very first bar of soap, even after six weeks, um, it's not going to last nearly as long as a bar of soap that maybe you've had sitting for three months. And then so at that <laughs> point, you can store them wherever you want to store them. You know, I... I've got them in a little bucket in my house right now. In my last house, I had them in a shoebox. It was in a drawer. So, um, you know, it's really up to you how you want to store them. Um, you can make little cute labels on them and give them away as gifts. Uh, it's totally up to you. But anyway, um, hopefully this was helpful, you guys. And I hope you give it a try. Just remember to take the necessary precautions and respect what lie can do. Um, and if you are taking those precautions and you have a healthy respect for the caustic nature of that chemical, um, then, you know, it's really not as scary as you might think. So anyway, I hope you guys give this a try. Let me know. Let me know if you have any questions. See you guys later. Take care.